thanks for coming. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, welcome to this session on next ge generation MongoDB. Uh, this is a 30 minute session. We're going to cover transactions, logical sessions, and uh, streams, change streams in particular, if we get to them. Let's see how we're doing in the time. My name is Christoph Strober. I work for Pivotal as part of the Spring Data team, and I'm so happy to have Jeff here with me today. Hi, my name is Jeff Yemen, and I'm an engineer on the drivers team at MongoDB, and I'm one of the maintainers of the MongoDB Java driver. Yeah, and we had a really good time implementing all uh, these cool new features for MongoDB, both on the driver side as well as on the Spring Data support side here. So, and to be honest with you, I'm a huge fan of fantasy books, and I have this fantasy bookstore. It's just an ordinary bookstore with some sort of REST API. Uh, so you can basically get a list of books uh, via the REST API, and then you can select a single book, and eventually you can place an order for a book via the REST API by just pushing a post request to uh, the server. And prior to MongoDB 4.0 with uh, multi-document transactions, I followed the advice of uh, keeping track of orders and the number of available books within the stock within a single document in MongoDB. As uh, till the 4.0 version and, and beyond, of course, uh, updates on the single document uh, have been atomic all, all along. So I kept, uh, I kept trace of the number of available books uh, within the books collection, as well as I had an array uh, that uh, just kept track of who ordered a particular book. But now with MongoDB 4.0, we have uh, multi-document transactions that can span multiple collections. So we can now uh, tear apart basically uh, the, this constraint of having uh, the, the, uh, the order and the number of books available in, in, in one collection, but we can rather have it in a dedicated order collection where we have the dedicated order referencing the book over there, still keeping track of the number of available copies in stock. And yeah, Jeff, would you be so nice and tell us a little bit more about MongoDB transactions? Yeah, so in MongoDB 4.0, we introduced multi-document transactions. Um, so when we were thinking about this feature in 4.0, we had a few requirements. So um, first, we wanted to maintain the asset guarantees that we have always had for single document transactions. Um, across multiple documents and multiple collections and databases. And from the programming perspective, we wanted it to be a very familiar API. So we wanted it to be conversational, multi-statement, so very much like you're familiar with um, from other transactional stores that you might have used. So um, in the programming style, you would start a transaction, you might update one collection, do a query for a second collection, update a third collection, and then uh, commit or abort the transaction. Um, so we announced uh, publicly the support for transactions earlier in this year and then released it just a few months later. And that might have surprised some people who have used MongoDB for a while that we did it so fast, but um, it's, we've actually been working on this for quite a while um, under the cover. So if we look back to uh, MongoDB 3.0 even, this is when we integrated the WireTiger storage engine into MongoDB. Um, previously, we had a storage engine called MMAP. Um, and WireTiger, um, out of the box, had support for MVCC, which is multi-version concurrency control. Um, and this allows WireTiger to uh, create a snapshot of the, of the uh, storage layer um, so that you can apply, uh, so that it can apply writes um, atomically um, with snapshot isolation. And even with single document transactions, that's useful because when you think about a single document transaction in Mongo, not only you're updating the document, but you also might be updating one or more indices that that document um, is contained in. So we use the MVCC feature of WireTiger um, to do that atomically and allow uh, MongoDB 3.0 to, to have what we call back then document level locking. Um, so that took us through the 3.4 release, and then in 3.6, uh, we started adding some more of the precursors to transactions. So uh, this took the form of two user visible features. Uh, the first is logical sessions, and the second is retriable writes, which is built on top of logical sessions. 
So a logical session is essentially just a UUID that is managed by the driver, so the, the, your application, and it allows the driver to um, associate a sequence of operations with an identifier that it controls. And let me show you how, how that is used with retriable writes in 3.6. So with the retriable writes turned on, which you can just do by setting retry writes in the connection string, um, if we send an update to uh, MongoDB with retry writes to true, you can see that not only do we send the updates, but now we send two numbers. One is this LS ID, which is the session ID, and along with the transaction number, which is just an integer. And let's say we get an IO exception um, from that write request. Well, now the driver can retry that write, sending back the same updates with the same LS ID and transaction number, and get back the response. And the server remembers that the, write, the last write on that session with that transaction number, and if that write has already happened, it will just send the response back, and if it hasn't happened yet, um, the server will execute the write um, and then return the result. So the key thing here is that with 3.6, the server is now able to remember something about a previous operation and associate that with um, this pair, this transaction number LSID pair um, that the client is sending. So in MongoDB 4.0, we built on that to support replica set only transactions. And we'll see a little later uh, when, we de when we demo the application how we're using the same concepts of LSID and transaction number um, to implement transactions. And just as a sneak peek, um, in MongoDB 4.2, which will be the next major release, we'll support uh, sharded cluster transactions. So this will be um, a si single asset transactions over a sharded cluster with a two-phase commit protocol um, to coordinate the transactions among the shards. So let's take a look at um, in our demo application and see what this looks like in the programming model. Yeah, so absolutely. Turn it over to Christoph. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, the demo application is up on GitHub, so you can play around with it later if you want to. Um, basically, it's a, a Spring Boot application, and we're making use of Spring profiles in here to just show you different aspects of doing transactions, like with just the plain Java driver with Spring support, maybe reactive, how to retry stuff. So we're using Spring profiles for this. Other than that, it's just a Spring, uh, a Spring Boot application, as you can see here. We got our default configuration, we got a Mongo template, we got a, the native Mongo client over here. We're just adding a command line listener to just print stuff, as you can see down below, onto the console in a pretty way so that you can follow along what happens on actually the network layer, which commands are sent at which time. Um, we're using Spring uh, Web, web MV, uh, Spring, the functional web framework from Spring uh, to just get our REST endpoints out there. So we got a books endpoint for listing the books and, and all this stuff. And for uh, the synchronous part of the demonstration, we're just wrapping the synchronous responses into reactive uh, response types, which is like flux from a treble or, and whatnot. And that's been pretty much it. We have also, of course, our domain types over here, like the book with the authors and uh, the number of available copies, as, as well we have the uh, order for a customer date and the, uh, and the list of books that got ordered. Um, we already got here uh, a MongoDB instance running as a single node replica set. And yeah, let's take a look. Let me just quickly run the application. All right, so on, on every application startup, we initialize uh, a set of fantasy books, in this case, into, into the uh, collection, and then we can basically go on and hit the rest endpoint to retrieve uh, the books that we have in our collection in here. And since I know that Jeff is not such a huge fan of fantasy books and is more into science fiction, we got a dedicated book for Jeff in here as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, now we can go on and just select, let's say, Jeff's book. And there you go. And we, obviously, we want to order Jeff's book. And yeah, 
Do I have it in the, hindus, uh, in the history? Yeah, I just add a little timeout to the REST call so we can just now go on and step through what happens when you're using multi-document transactions. So let's do this. All right, there you go. So first we're going to show what this looks like with the native MongoDB driver. Um, so you can see right here that we are at the beginning of a try block and we're starting a client session um, by calling mongoclient.start session. Are you going to step through that? Yeah. So if you look down below, this is where we have um, the output of, and as Christoph said before, we're showing um, in the console all the commands that are sent to the server, like the actual commands um, with this command listener that he registered in the profile. Um, so you can see here that actually nothing was sent to the server when we, sent, when we executed start session because the driver is actually managing that UUID, the LSID by itself. So why don't you step over the start transaction. Again here, nothing is sent to the server when we start a transaction. All that does is allocate a new transaction number associated with the LSID. Remember that from retriable rights. So the transaction number will be one. Now we step over our insert. Now here's the first message that was sent to the server. Um, in the transaction, you can see that it's an insert. And then if you scroll down a little bit, then you see there's the LSID um, that's associated with that client session, and then the transaction number one, um, which is associated with that transaction that we started. Now there's a couple of other uh, fields that we pass, start transaction equals true, to let the server know this is the first message uh, from the transaction, and then auto commit false basically just is really how we distinguish it from a retrieval write. Um, we say, don't commit this yet. We're going to tell you when. All right, continue on with the update. The update looks very similar. Um, we have an update statement, and then the LSID will be the same. The transaction number will be the same. The only difference is we don't have start transaction. Um, but otherwise, everything's all the same as the insert. And why don't you step over to the commit? And then the commit transaction sends a final message to the server. It's the commit transaction command. Again, the LSID transaction number will be the same, and that commits the transaction. All right. So now we just need to send the response back to the client, and we're actually done. And if we are looking at the collection itself, uh, I should have opened that before. I'm sorry for that. Just give me a second. There is the fantasy bookstore. There are the collection. There is the book. There is Jeff's book. So we decreased the number of available copies. I hope you can read that in the back. And of course, we got our order collection. And there is this very first order. So let's quickly go to the error scenario and order a few more books, because we only got three copies available. So right now we should have run out of books and try to actually buy another one that isn't there anymore. All right, there we go. So here we are again. We're starting the transaction, of course, and I'll just step right into here. So this is basically the part where the transaction gets aborted later right, on. So if we throw an exception from within this try block, oh, the the uh, client session is closable, so when the, close method, meths, when the close method of client session is called, um, the client session will notice that the transaction is open and it hasn't been committed yet, so it'll automatically abort it, so you don't have to have an explicit abort um, in your code. Um, and one other thing I wanted to point out, just to link it back to retriable writes, um, the same thing we can do with retriable writes with retrying the write if it fails, also happens with the commit transaction on the abort transaction. So if the, com uh, if the commit or abort fails uh, the first attempt, the driver will try to reconnect and resend the commit uh, or the abort to the server. Um, and the server will know whether it happened or not, just like it did with retriable rights, and just return the, res the actually what the result of the transaction is. All right, so let's continue there. And there you go. Uh, you should now be able to see down here on the network layer that the transaction got aborted by sending the, of course, board transaction command, just as Jeff said before. Right, so, and we got, of course, the error in the response. All right. So, shall we have a look at the Spring support that we built around all this? Yeah. Yeah, let's go for it. All right, let me just activate the 
transaction Spring transaction support via this profile. So we had the native MongoDB client uh, right now. And what I want you to notice, please, is that we are starting the session in here. And for all the requests that we, have, for all the commands that we are sending to the server, you have to uh, basically push the, the session uh, along with the commands so that those are associated. When you're using uh, Spring Manage Transaction Support, uh, all you act, uh, currently have to do is, when we scroll down to the, to the synchronous transaction uh, profile here, is uh, obviously you need a Mongo Transaction Manager. So you need to have a platform, a Spring Platform Transaction Manager in place. Uh, you could have a, a JPA one as well, but we're using the native MongoDB implementation over here. Uh, the reason why I point out the transaction manager as a bean in here explicitly is because prior to MongoDB 4.0, there haven't been any transactions. And if uh, we register automatically uh, this very bean with our configuration, you might run into issues if you run a pre 4.0 server with uh, this configuration. So we want you guys to be aware that you are, you're, you're configuring your application for transaction support because we learned the hard way that there is obviously uh, people out there just having a transactional on some methods or services for documentation, though they aren't really transactional so far. But in this case, it would fail. And just to make sure you really know uh, that you want to enable this, uh, we didn't provide it for you, but you have to register your bean. And that's pretty much all it takes to get started with the transaction, uh, Spring Managed Transaction Support. So inside the Transaction Manager, there is mean to basically start a transaction and of course commit and abort uh, the transaction, which then basically goes on and calls the according, com according commands on the Mongo Java client. All right, um, let's have a look at the uh, water service, what it actually looks like. So we are using a transaction template in here. Who knows about transaction template? Prior to the, all right, anyone knows the at enable transaction support? Yeah, okay. So this is basically sim similar to the declarative support. So you could basically go here at at transactional and enable the at transactional uh, via the profile, but we're using for the sake of the demo and being very explicit, um, the transaction template in here. So it takes the transaction manager and then you're basically, once you enter this block, you're inside uh, one of those spring managed transactions and we do just the very same stuff that we saw before. So we have uh, an order repository, which is one of spring data's CRUD repositories. So we're going to create an order, persist the order, and all the uh, session and transaction stuff that we saw before is basically hidden within the transaction manager. So the repository is aware of an ongoing transaction. It proxies under the hood a uh, MongoDB collection as well as the MongoDB database and passes along the session ID for you. And of course, starts and stops the, the transaction. And that's been pretty much it. So let's just run uh, this example with this profile. All right, the application starts up. We're going to the books endpoint again. This time I'm choosing another book. Let me, this is one of my favorites, the core. Uh, going to the details and of course, now I'm trying to order that one. I'm going to post the book and then order and there you go, uh, on the, you see it's, there, there is actually no difference. We sent, the, we sent the insert command along with the start transaction. We're going through the update and then finally coming to the commit and all is done so far. Right. So that's one thing I think we should point out about transactions in MongoDB. So if you have concurrent transactions that are attempting to modify the same document, the way MongoDB currently operates is that the first transaction to modify the document wins, and any subsequent transactions that are executing concurrently will error out with a write conflict. Um, and the driver will um, detect that and 
uh, throw an exception um, to the application, a Mongo exception with a certain uh, error label which says that the transaction, um, you're basically getting a transient transaction error. Um, so we want to demo that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So let's see how, how this feels when you're inside the real application. So we're starting the application again, initializing all the data. Uh, nothing changed there so far. And what we're now going to do is we're going to the Mongo shell and actually on the shell, we're going to start a new session. So we retrieve the new session ID. On the session, we'll be starting a new transaction. And now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to send this very command uh, to the books collection trying to decrease uh, the number of stock for one of those books. And then once we do this, we just leave uh, the transaction open so we, we don't commit anything over here. And now on the other side, uh, this is like simultaneously, we try to just boom, uh, order this very book. And it obviously fails with the right conflict Jeff just mentioned before. But now if you of course go on and commit the session, uh, commit the transaction over here on the console and just retry to order the book, it obviously, it works because the write lock on the document got removed and we are now able to just uh, order that very book. So I wonder if there's a way we can deal with this better in spring. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. We can deal with this a little bit better. And the way we want to do is, is by just adding uh, another Spring uh, project to the application. And, what it, and this project is basically Spring Retry. Um, we got a profile for this as well, but I don't think that the time allows us to demo this in, in full detail. So please just check it out uh, yourselves. There is a, a profile that enables a retry via the at enable retry. This is a, a spring retry annotation. And what it allows you to do is basically on the order service that we have here, you can add something like at retryable. And uh, so if there is conflict or an exception thrown, then it will basically, by default, for three times, retry the operation with a back of time of five seconds. So uh, you wouldn't see the response in first place. So this scenario before, uh, it would error after 15 seconds or complete successfully if the other transaction succeeded in between. So this is a, a pretty neat way of dealing with those uh, errors and write conflicts. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So one other thing I think we should talk about um, is reactive support. So um, you might not be aware, but the MongoDB uh, Java driver also has a reactive streams implementation um, that's built on top of Netty. Um, and I know that Spring Data uh, leverages that in their reactive components. So uh, um, you want to show how we can do transactions um, with reactive? Absolutely. So. Let's just switch the profile on, which would be reactive transactions. And uh, what this does is basically it goes over here and uses, we got the book repository in this case. We're just using a reactive one for exposing all the, the books that we have. And we have a reactive order service in here. And the main difference that you'll notice is that there is no like, uh, reactive order repository in here that can operate transactionally. And this is because there is no support at this time for reactive repositories uh, and transactions. So you have to go down onto the template level for now, because uh, we're still lacking a, a bit of a more advanced concept down here. And you can go on with the reactive Mongo operations and we give you an in transaction close, closure just as maybe you've seen it today in the keynote uh, with the uh, reactive database driver. So you get this, this notion of a closure and inside that closure there is actually the transaction started. We're using a reactor context to just uh, store Mongo client session information within the context and then pass it on uh, for all those calls. So you, again, you inside this closure, you don't actually see the session that's been, that is there behind the scenes uh, and gets invoked and of course rolled back in case of an error. And all you see inside this closure, uh, errors in there lead, uh, uh, 
When there is an error within the closure, of course, then uh, the transaction is rolled back or aborted. Uh, errors, however, outside this closure, like somewhere down here in the reactive flow, those won't affect the transaction itself and the transaction within the closure will, will have been committed, though the reactive flow might run, run into an, a conversion error or whatever you have later on. All right. So I don't think we have time to demo this in detail because we got four more minutes. Should we talk about chain streams? We could. Uh, yeah, let me just finish this one up uh, real quick. Um, for, however, for the reactive multi-document transaction support, as I said, we're currently lacking a better concept, which doesn't mean we aren't working on it. Yes, we are. The Spring team and the Spring framework is working on it, so we might have something transactional returning a reactive type like a mono and whatever. So it might happen that we will in subsequent releases will deprecate this in-transaction closure in favor of just having a more, uh, a, a better concept, so to speak. All right, change streams? Yeah, yes. let's do it. All right. Let's move on to change streams, um, which is like uh, previously you've been tailing the op log to just get uh, changes that happened on a uh, collection and database level. You correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but now uh, you, can, you have a dedicated API that le lets you listen to the, those changes happening. And we have a profile in here and I, I definitely want to activate this reactive change streams. And it's pretty easy actually, because all you have to do is, uh, you have to have a, a Mongo template, basically, and on this template, the Fluent API allows you to register a change stream on a particular collection. So you could say, okay, give me all the changes in an order collection. In this case, we're using uh, an empty change stream option. So you could have, you could resume on timestamp. You can resume on a timestamp or a resume token or a resume token, so you could pass those on in there and it would continue from there on. And then we're just printing it with the on next command to the console and later on, we're just to start this whole process, uh, we're going to subscribe to it. So let me quickly run that. That should run, there you go. And if I now, place the order, you can see in here reactively on the console that we get notified by the database that there has a new entry arrived within the orders collection. So this is a, a very neat way to see what's going, going on in there. You can filter it using aggregations, right? You can filter with aggregations, so you can match on particular patterns in your documents. Um, you can match on the type of update um, and then apply essentially any um, aggregation filter as post-processing. Awesome, awesome. And this works with, well with transactions because um, obviously the transaction, the updates you make in your transaction won't appear um, to watch until the transaction, uh, transaction actually commits and if they're rolled back, obviously it will never appear so you won't see any um, uncommitted data in your chain stream. Perfect, so as you saw, those multi-document transactions fit perfectly well into the Spring ecosystem and the Spring transaction support. And yeah, it's been a great collaboration with the folks over at MongoDB working together on this stuff. And I'm so happy that we were uh, both here today to present this to you. Um, real great. Um, MongoDB 4.0 is out, as well as is the Spring Data Loveless release train. Both are available right now. You can use Spring Boot 2.1 M4, it's all there for you, and yeah. And if you follow those URLs at the bottom, um, especially mongodb.com slash transactions, there are a lot of interesting developer talks from members of our server team that will take you into much more gory detail about how transactions are implemented on the server if you're interested. With that, thanks for your time.